Coming up on this week's episode of Destination Linux, we have your community feedback. Pine64 announces convergent package with more powerful Pine phone and a USB dock. We'll also talk about what real convergent is. Using Nano, is that okay? A great game dial, part of the humble indie bundle, and our beloved tips and tricks and software picks. All of this and so much more coming up on this week of Destination Linux. Q animation. Here we go. Happy <sighs> Linux. Yeah. Last Geek is my favorite. Look at him, he's so great. I love Noah, but I don't like Michael. Nobody likes Michael. Wait, this, this, that, that, that really was huge. a weird turn on the destination. Not really. It was actually pretty no, perfect. Good intro. Oh, okay. Perfect. Perfect. It's- Welcome to Destination Linux episode 183. This is a podcast about sharing our passion for Linux and open source. My name is Noah. Delighted to be here with you today. With me is the engineering crew of the latest Hannah Montana LTS, now featuring Python 7.8, made specifically for Ryan because he wants the latest version of Python. Michael and Ryan, welcome to the show. Let's find out what everybody has been up to this week. Michael, I guess we'll start with you. Um, What's been going on in your world this week? Well, I've been doing quite a bit, a lot of stuff on my new my YouTube channel. I did a new vi- a video about distro bases and derivatives, talking about what flavors, forks, and re- remixes and respins and all that stuff is. And it was it was interesting because after I explained it, I realized I needed to do a little bit more and also maybe do some Venn diagrams. So I'm going to make a up uh, like a companion piece on the front page of Linux website where you can get like the actual like a flow chart for all these things and what they mean and that kind of stuff. You, when you check it out, it in was the a comments. good video. I enjoyed it because honestly, I didn't realize how much I didn't know about the different terms that were out there. Uh, Noah, this would be one. I normally we have a watch party that we don't invite Michael to, like he has his watch party, he doesn't invite us to. This one we should have a watch party and not make fun of them. And maybe we could learn from this one video, Michael. This one video, yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I occasionally come up with them. Uh, Ryan, what uh, what's new in your world? Well, I ne- we need to take back for a second and talk about technology and how it's going to change all of our lives. We have many situations where we want to keep our loved ones around forever. And there's all this sci-fi, te- sci-fi technology and movies and things that talk about being able to download your consciousness into a computer. And that way they will be around forever. And so what I spent my time this week doing was downloading Michael's consciousness into a computer because I felt like he should be around forever. Okay. And so I, co- I coded you know, for future generations, because think about it, 100 years from now, Michael won't be here. But I have coded a Python program that perfectly resembles a chat conversation with Michael. It is out there on <sighs> doskeepcommunity.com. And it's not remotely perfect. It's really weird. It's like basically, basically, if you've ever wanted responds, to know what hold it's like, on, I'll be five minutes. Give me a second. <laughs> yes, it's it's delayed. The program delays even starting, so it's very realistic in in actions like that. And you know, he plays games in the AI, the chatbot, and everything. So if you want to go have a conversation with what it's like to have an actual conversation with real Michael, you can go out there and download that Python script today. I have basically created. Well, the world's most advanced AI. I mean, you could also just join the Discord server, the Mumble server, and uh, be a part of the community. That's also a way to have a conversation with me, rather than this weird nonsense thing that way doesn't... better through the program. <laughs> he even draws pictures and stuff uh, in the program. Uh, it's very <laughs> realistic, Noah. So I highly recommend everyone go check it out. Um, it sounds it sounds realistic. That you, sounds great. I, uh, I I I would like to I would like to sit down and have a conversation with this with this Python version of Michael and see what it responds. But we don't have perfect. time to talk to him in real life, so this is just the same thing, basically. Yeah, perfect. I'm also I really appreciate the fact that you took my artistry and put it into the system too. Very important to include this. <laughs> anyway. Does the does the does the does the AI Michael also advocate for stools? Oh yeah, he he absolutely but, advocates for stools. You'll learn all kinds of facts about Michael. You may never know his favorite color. All kinds of stuff is in there. Oh in this, wow, that's interesting. I'm curious so. what the bot says since I've never talked to you about that ever. So that's this will be fun. It's probably related to stools, I assume. But Noah, what have you been up to this week? Well, I actually had a very unique opportunity. We did another one of our uh, events at Alta Speed, and um, yet again, doing an event, they came and said, "Hey, we'd like some technical support." So we gave that to them. But in doing so, well, what we ended up doing was using Linux to to run the entire event. So that was 
that was pretty fun. And I, I again, I learned a lot. It seems like every time I go back and circle back to see what else Linux can do, it turns out they're able to, or the, the operating system is able to do a lot more than it was the last time that I had played with it. So I was, I was really thankful for that. Um, and then above and beyond that, I started to play with the multi-room uh, features of Volumio and started to put separate amplifiers throughout my house, all controlled with Volumio. And then those are, of course, tied back to Home Assistant. Lots so, of uh, lots of Linux fun. So on the Volumio, you're using Raspberry Pis for that, right? That's right. Yep. Okay. So I saw that there was a module that you can get for Raspberry Pi. I didn't get to do a lot of research in it. That basically is one of the hats to the Raspberry Pi that turns each high if you were going to set one up in your own home system into an amplifier it's an amplifier hat that goes over the top or using something like that to increase the audio output to each speaker or is Volumio use something different right so it's a jbl amplifier i'm using a jbl amplifiers that are rack mounted in the basement and then each volumeo feeds a amplifier so right now i have kids bedroom master bedroom outside and then common area so like kitchen living room those kinds of things um, and then those four amps tie back to four Volumio boxes uh, and four amplifiers. And then the speakers are mounted inside of the ceiling and then the cable is all run back. So all of the actual electronics, all the guts are sitting downstairs. I don't have to deal with that. It just in each room, there's a little touchscreen that allows you to control uh, Volumio. And then there's a physical volume knob that that physically turns the speakers on or off because the last thing you want to deal with when a phone call comes in or when somebody's at the door, when something happens and you just need the automation to stop for a second, the last thing you want is, Oh no, home assistant crash. So I can't get talk right. to volume. On to no, I just need the music to stop. So I have physical, physical switches at every location. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah. You know what else is awesome? The fact that this episode is sponsored by, digital ocean and the reality is what you can play with on a pie and what the raspberry pi has done for your ability to play with projects at home and try out different software digital ocean has done for the enterprise so you have the opportunity now with their optimized uh, scaling and and intuitive api and multiple storage options to try different stuff out commercial grade stuff because you know what you can't replicate inside your house you just can't replicate a data center and so when you tell yourself hey i want to get off google i want to go all my own way i want to self-host everything. Well, that sounds great in theory, but you have to have a way to bring that to fruition. You know what Google has? They have data center and they have data center technicians and they have servers and they have high availability and they have scaling and APIs and all and load balancers and so much more. You know who else has that? DigitalOcean. You know how much they'll give it to you for? Five bucks a month. Actually, it's not even five bucks a month because if you get started by using do.co slash DLN, they're going to give you a $100 credit. So that means you could spin up a dozen droplets for a couple of months or you could spin up one month monster droplet and move all of your stuff to one single server. It's a terrible idea. Don't do that. There's no redundancy in it. But if you wanted to do that, the option is yours. DigitalOcean makes that a possibility. The other thing is because of their one-click deployments, I don't want to deploy a LAMP stack by installing all of the individual components. I'd rather just click on LAMP stack and have it show up for me and then I can shoehorn that into whatever project I'm doing. But DigitalOcean makes that easy with their one-click deployments. If you don't, if you want to learn the foo, if you want to dig into it and say, I want to do this myself, well, they have their tutorials. And those tutorials, by the way, they're they're platform agnostic. So that means you can use those tutorials to do it at your home and then scale it up to a DigitalOcean droplet when you're ready. Again, do.co slash DLN, do.co slash DLN. That's a hundred dollar credit. And a huge thanks to DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of Destination Linux. In the community feedback this week, Lucas writes us to say, Dear Destination Linux team, I would like to contribute to the discussion on monitor stands in episode 177. Michael was specifically called out for having an abundance of monitors but lacking a stand or stands. I wasn't really called out. I was asking a question about how, because I, I want to kind of change the way I do my monitors to have be more flexibility, but we'll continue on. Uh, it says, I'm affiliated with the German Space Operations Center, so having uh, building and maintaining desks with extraordinary amounts of monitors is kind of a nece necessity for us. Uh, for those consoles, we do not use traditional monitor stands. We have T-slot metal rails integrated with the individual desks. Vase amounts are secured to the horizontal rails above the desk to hold individual monitors and allow for very custom screen positioning. Uh, granted, wild reconfiguration tools are required. The layout of this is v much more than I need it to be. Uh, yeah, but it, I loved it. It I looks like, awesome. Oh, I want this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's it's really cool. I do want it. And I like the idea of having this like railing system and the flexibility of it. But 
It might be a little bit over the top. I mean, I don't have my own uh, space no flight thing. operations. You know, I don't necessarily need that much stuff. <laughs> But it is pretty cool, and uh, it, I, it, for those who are interested in like what I was re- asking about, what this this feedback is related to, it is uh, related to a question I had on a previous episode about whether it'd be a good idea to have a single monitor arm that has like the the gas hinging or whatever it's called that allows you to uh, control each monitor separately, so that you can like spin them or position them and however you want to, but also have the flexibility to like stability and flexibility to move to portrait mode or landscape mode anytime you want to, or would it be easier to have or better, right? Both either way uh, to have a, a setup where you have three individual monitor stands or monitor arms that have that flexibility rather than having one what built in. What would be better is if you would set up a German space operations center model right. where I, you're I, using I, aluminum V slots Yes. Uh, in order to have custom vertical mounting surfaces for equipment so it doesn't take up your desk space. And that is what we all want you to do, Michael. Fair enough. That's a good point. So thanks, Lucas, for sending that in. It's pretty awesome. If you want to learn learn more about it, I'll have a link to the space operations facility in the show notes. And they would be interested in my Michael AI for the space <laughs> program. They might be able to send the first AI into space. <laughs> you Michael need No, you need to have redundancy. Before. You need to have a, like multiple bots for that to work. <laughs> So we all know how much we love Pine 64, and every time they seem to release a new product, it's pretty much time to get your wallet out because you know a couple of things. One, it's going to be fantastically priced, and number two, it's going to be great hardware. Well, they made another announcement this week. So in addition to the regular $149 Pine phone model, which I love seeing all the pictures and tweets, and even in our Destination Links Telegram group, people are getting their phones, they're taking pictures of it basically sharing the experience with everyone, releasing a new Pine Phone convergence package on top of that, which of course you're going to get a bunch of extra things like three gigabytes of RAM in this one. You get 32 gigabytes of the embedded storage. You also get a USB dock and this USB dock comes with a type C connector. So we know Noah is on board already to connect your phone. And then from there you get HDMI out, two more USB 2.0 ports and even an ethernet port. And of course, something like this, when you're upgrading this much, is going to go for three, four hundred dollars. Nope, just 199 bucks, and it's going to dispatch in August 2020. So for 199 bucks, it's well worth the 40 dollar increase here in order to pick up the phone from the 150 dollar original model, in my opinion. So if you're looking at getting a Pine phone, definitely go check out that convergence pack because. They also have the hug of death that's hit their website the second they announced it. It pretty <laughs> much crashed their website. Yep. Everybody was clicking, trying to see and get information on it, which is really good news for Pine yeah. 64, I think, out there. It is really cool. And, and it's really happy. I'm really happy to see that they had that so much interest and in, to the point where it did crash their website. And they put on Twitter, it was something like, hey, hey, it turns out we uh, we are we're having some issues with our website. And just so you know, we try. We did it. We did our best to make sure we were prepared for this kind of thing. But uh you know, you know, try it tomorrow. And I was like, that's a great, that's a great approach. Like, Hey, it is what it is. We're, we're working on it, but yeah. On getting one, you definitely need to go there. Noah, didn't you get a Mm -hmm. pine phone? I did. In fact, I tried out, uh, uh, UB ports for a little bit, but the, the lack of disc encryption kind of was a, was a deal breaker for me. The thing that I'm excited about, and I know this is what substantial amount of our discussion is going to come in today is the idea of convergence and what convergence means and how we are going to uh, how we're going to tackle that nut so to kind of set this up a couple of things um i think we can all acknowledge that apple is very heavily moving towards mobile every time you look at a new version of mac os looks a little bit closer to ios google has kind of dug all in on android and chrome os it seems like every time they turn around they want everything to run inside of a chrome browser and they're going to make sure that your chrome browser can run on Windows, Linux, Mac, iPad, iOS, Android, doesn't matter. Um, They just want you to live inside of the Chrome browser. And Microsoft wants you to, I guess, go to software Microsoft as a wants. service. They want to put into Azure. They want to put into Office 365s and Teams and, and so on and so forth. Um, I think it was Monday of this week or Tuesday of this week. Went into a service call. They said, Outlook is down on all of these clients. I said, okay. So I start going through them. I mean, something must be up. Go in. All of a sudden, while I'm there, I get a call from another client. Outlook is down at all of our sites. What is going on? Come to find out Office 365 had a massive outage this week. And they and they issued an update that caused Outlook. It would open up and then it would immediately close back down again. And nobody could figure out why. That's a feature. And it is. Well, so what it is, <laughs> Ryan, is it's, it, it's, it's evidence to me 
that we are reaching a time where people are really sick of technology being in the way and they want technology to get out of the way and just let them do their job. They just want to be able to get their, their, their work done. And most people are willing to pay a monthly fee to have that happen. And this is a paradigm shift in the way that we have operated with computers from in the past. And frankly, I think we in open source and Linux should we should pay attention and should perk up and say, okay, this is the direction that the rest of the world wants to go, where people pay for a service and that service is downloaded via app or app store um, to their mobile device and they'll just purchase their technology from the cell phone stores. So in that world, who do we have that is fighting for free and open source, uh, a free and open source way of doing that? Well, that would be the people of Ubi ports, that would be the people of Sailfish OS, and, and from the hardware side, that would be people like Pine64. And what's interesting about this Pine64 article on frontpagelinux.com is that this, this really speaks to how people how we all believe people want to interface with their technology. They take the phone, they put all their data on it, they use it, they get all their apps set up, and then they just go from place to place and plug the phone in and get a large format monitor and a keyboard and a mouse and a docking station and a printer and internet and whatever else. And they have access to more powerful resources when that phone is docked, but then it comes back in your pocket and you, and you walk around. Now, everybody has their own idea. Microsoft has their own idea of what convergence is. Canonical had their own idea what convergence is. Pine clearly has their own idea what, what convergence is. Even Librem has their own idea what convergence is. So I guess, Michael, I'll start with you. What are your thoughts? Is this the right direction for free and open source companies to, to be going? Is this a good direction for them to go? Or um, is, this, uh, is this a waste of time? Should we be focusing more on the Linux desktop? I think that there's definitely some value, and I really like the fact that they're focusing on the thing that they are good at, which is creating hardware for this particular purpose, and I'm I'm really happy that they're doing this. And this this is really cool announcement because the Convergence package is, one, a more powerful phone than the previous one, and the previous one hasn't even been out that long, and they were already able to make a newer, more powerful version. So I'm super excited about that. And they have like a three gig RAM and the the, the a double the amount of storage is on the phone and all kinds of, of like really cool stuff that they've done. And this convergence like adapter thing is cool because it has it has the stuff that you expect it to have, like an HDMI port and it has the USB ports, but also having an Ethernet port for your phone is a really cool idea, a part of this thing. And it's like a single package. I love the idea of doing this, and I'm glad that there's there is a, a company focusing on creating this uh, convergence approach. And also we have other companies working on the desktop and others on the servers and enterprise and that sort of stuff. So I think that in a way, because we have so many different companies working on different things, we have that value of not having to worry about, you know, are the, are we spreading too thin or in that sense? Uh, but I'm really happy that they're doing it. And I think that the approach to convergence and my ideal is not necessarily having one device that handles everything. I'd rather have multiple devices that are specific for their purposes and they have just full connection between each other, like full integration. And like, because to me, real convergence is having the devices that I want to have enough power to do the things that I need them to do and then have them all work together. And, you know, there's some people have different opinions of what real convergence is, but to me, that's what it should be. I want a desktop to be as powerful as a desktop can be. I want the laptop to be very powerful, but still portable and light. And I also want my phones to do the phones thing, but I want them all to work together. And I think that having one device that does everything is not really convergence, at least not in my ideal world. Well, so, right purism disagrees, right, with the idea of convergence being what Pine has done here. Now, they didn't specifically mention Pine, but they did release an article right around the time that this news came out about Pine 64 from their chief security officer, Kyle Rankin, who basically mentions that, you know, stretching a phone or tablet UI to the size of a desktop monitor by connecting your phone is fake convergence, which is what Pine essentially is doing here. We have seen other products do this in the past as well. You know, it, it's an interesting idea because they're basically stating that they have the real convergence, which means bringing your desktop computer with you wherever you go. Um, they're saying at Purism, when they talk about convergence, it's with Pure OS, where they start with the desktop OS and shrink it down to your pocket. 
I've, having played in the Mac ecosystem, we can talk about the fact that there are issues with the overpriced hardware, the repairability, the forced obsolescence, all of this thing. But I will tell you one thing Apple has down better than anybody, and that is, in my opinion, actual convergence. If I'm on my phone, even though there are two separate operating systems, I can send my browser to my desktop. I can send photos to my desktop. In fact, they all immediately appear as an option if I'm wanting to share. My text messages come through in both areas if I want them to. Everything is basically interconnected, all of the software and programs. If I have something open on my phone and I want it on my desktop, I just click send to my desktop and it'll say which one of your Apple computers you want to send it to and boom, it pops up. If you want to save a file and from on your phone and you can save it to your desktop. So they have figured out convergence, I think, better than anybody else to this point. Of course, it's much easier for them because they have one set of hardware to focus on. But that to me is the first time I experienced true convergence. And I could tell you it's quite amazing as somebody who makes video content and things, being able to just send stuff immediately where I need it and have it show up is extremely useful. To me, that's real convergence. I don't think what purism is doing is real convergence to Michael's point either. And I think Pine's idea is it's a stepping stone thing. You're not going to have what Apple's created with a trillion dollar company overnight. It's going to take time. You're going to have to build that step by step. And I think what Pine's doing here with a suite of products like the time, the watch, the tablet, the phone, and the laptops are all going to give you then that ability as the software developers and open source community to create the kind of convergence that we've seen in a model that works, which is like what Apple had done. So I think they're closer actually than this idea of just having, you know, your phone runs the same operating system as your desktop. I think it's a cool idea too. It's just not to me anything any more innovative than what Pine's working towards. Moran, I want to give you a sales pitch and I want to see which one you go for. Okay, here's sales pitch A. Sales pitch A is, hey, go ahead and buy this phone and we're going to allow you to place it into a docking center and the docking center is going to give you an HDMI out and a USB so you'll be able to connect a USB keyboard and a USB mouse um, to your phone. And isn't that cool? Uh, their sales pitch A, okay? okay? Here's sales pitch B. Um, the newest phone from our lineup is the phone model XYZ, and phone model XYZ uh, has a Thunderbolt connection on the bottom of it. And what's great about this is the, the reality is that a mobile operating system really doesn't scale to desktop operating systems. But the great thing is because now in the year 20, blah, 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 we have the ability to pack six processors inside of this phone, six ARM processors, and these things actually rival the core i7s back from like the 2020 era. I mean, that's how good these ARM processors have become. And now with this built-in Thunderbolt interface, you set your phone inside of this dock and you get a complete desktop uh, operating system. By the way, all of the apps that you buy, uh, you'll buy them on the phone inside of the app store. They're going to cost a lot of money. It's going to be a few hundred dollars, but we've worked with Adobe and Microsoft and all of these places to make sure that when you're on the phone, you get a mobile version of the of that so software presented. When you're running on the desktop version, when you're plugged into a dock, you get a desktop version. We have video editing suites. We have audio editing suites. Uh, all of your content syncs back up to our cloud. It only costs $99 a month for you to have all of this stuff. We'll replace the device for you anytime you break it. You just let us know and we'll ship you a new one. That's part of the coverage plan. That's an extra $15 a month. And so, yeah, for $150, uh, we basically, it's like technology for rent. We'll, we'll provide the technology to you. You have one device, all your data. Don't have to worry about it crypto way or don't have to worry about it company it don't have to worry about it by the way if you own a business just go ahead and sign up for one of these 150 dollar plans for every one of your employees we will they can just stop in here at the store we'll give them the device we use our central management software that you log in as the business and you say these are the apps they can get to here's the apps they can't here's the here's the data they don't have local access to and bada bing bada boom i've eliminated software piracy I've eliminated the fact that we have all these different platforms and different places that you have to buy at different configurations and layouts and all of that stuff. Monitors and peripherals just become that, things that we connect into the central device. And the company that designed this thing, all of their infrastructure, their cloud infrastructure, their app infrastructure, the relationships that they have with their software vendors, the relationships that they have with the cell phone carriers and the places that sell all these things, and the relationship that they have with all the tower operators to, to, to make this massive 7G network connect all together Together, um, that company sits supreme and who's going to touch them now which device are you going to buy well i feel like you well b obviously but i feel like you literally explained apple's model minus the thunderbolt 3 portion right. but yeah. today today but where are they going to be in five years where are they going to be in 10 years from now and so if you know when when we look at this and what so while we i, I guess 
I, and I don't mean to be blunt, but I can't think of any other way to say this. While we are sitting here looking at and saying, well, the Pine phone with the three gigabytes of RAM and the, and, and, and the dock, that's pretty cool. And Libram has a different idea and that's not as cool. So where I get to with all of that is we are not even skating in the same platform or in the same arena as where I think the average user is coming from. The average person is very content browsing Facebook on their phone, on their couch. So that's the bar that you're starting from. And that's how people prefer to interface with technology, whether or not we agree with it. And so the company that, that cracks this first, the company that cracks getting somebody to have what they ex consider to be an acceptable experience on the phone and deliver them a phenomenal experience on the desktop, but through their phone so that all of the apps that they already have are there, all of the ways that they like to contact and interface with people and the kind of ways that they like to create content and save their data and all those kinds of things, all of those translate perfectly. The first company to get that right is the company that's going to reign supreme. So if you want an opportunity to speak to people and say, hey, we are the, this is our opportunity to be a general purpose computing device. I believe this is it. I think this is the line in the sand, the last opportunity for us to, to sit down and dig in and say, here's how we can serve uh, the, 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 the average person that wants to do average things on their computer with open source. This is our opportunity to do that because I think once this becomes mainstream, once convergence becomes a thing and people are primarily using their phone and they're comfortable with that and the PC market and the, 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 the desktop laptop market idea has kind of moved on. That's a thing of the past. This the, the way that we like to interface with our computers will be something relegated to hobbyists. I don't think it will be the mainstream of computers. And I include developers in that. So who when do I you say think that. in Linux is the closest one to actually accomplishing that right now? I think nobody is close to, I, I, and here's, here's, I say that because of this, I say that because Ubi ports was jettisoned from canonical and canonical clearly feels that their, their money and their future and their efforts are better spent in cloud computing, building the backend infrastructure for the people that are going to run these things on the front end devices. I think that Microsoft has basically given up on mobile and again, kind of gone towards the cloud side, but the business end of the cloud side. So you'll buy Office 365, but all their apps work on iOS and Android. So right. they're, again, they're giving up that front user market. And you know what's interesting? I work, I own an IT company in where I make my money from going out and helping people with technology problems. And you know what I found? It's way more cost effective to go and support businesses than trying to support individual people because because individual people are di they're they're very difficult to support because they're difficult to draw formu formulas around. And what Apple has right, whether I like them or dislike them, what Apple has right is they don't ask people how they want to, how, what formula they want to use. Apple comes up with the formula and says, get on board or get lost. And those are your two choices. And so people naturally just say, okay, fine, I guess I'll jump on that ship. And there's some people that do, and there's some people that don't. But at the end of the day, Apple has a, a, a very straight and direct path. And so every time they iterate, every time they release something new, every time they do something, it's one step further. And if you look at where we are with convergence today, it's very reminiscent of the discussion we were having back in 2012 with, with uh, uh, convergence with canonical. Hey, here's a phone and we kind of got it to work sort of kind of on a dock. Right. No, you're not wrong. Yeah. I mean, I think that the overall convergence aspects of it is great, but I also don't think that that's necessarily the, the, the mainstream in the, in the sense of the people who don't want to deal with anything other than one device. I think you're right. But I think there's also a huge market that is underplayed by a lot of people that there are, you know, that having those individual devices that are specific for a purpose of like ext extreme power of like doing rendering and gaming and stuff, and then also having convergence with the other devices. I think that's the... There, there's no push though for a single device in any company that's serious. Like, you know, Apple is pushing a single processor, but you're still going to have the laptop lineup. You're still going to have the iPads. You're still, still going to have the phone. I think at some point you're going to have more of the laptop than the iPad will merge into one device. Right. But I don't How, think you're going to lose a computer any time in our future in the next. See, I, I I give it five. I give it five to ten years. Five to ten years for Apple to get to a point where the iPad Pro has a flip on uh, 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 keyboard. And when I say a flip on keyboard, I don't mean like a surface piece of crap magnetic thing that <laughs> flops all over the place. I mean like an actual keyboard. And so the top half of the iPad Pro 
is what looks like the top half of a MacBook and the bottom half of the MacBook becomes an add-on keyboard that you attach to your iPad Pro. Everything runs on iOS. Everything runs on ARM. All of the software uh, runs on there. But when you're connected to that kind of instance, you get presented with that kind of interface. Although even that I kind of question because I, I was playing with the latest version of, of Mac OS on some newer MacBooks we have at, at work. And the, the truth is that uh, the experience very much emulates iOS. It starts to look like iOS. Even the application launcher starts to look like iOS. There's a lot of there's a lot of cases, and I think conversions is important, and we need to, as a community to look at it in an ecosystem. And I'm glad that some people are doing it. But Nico Jet in the patron chat made a good point that we already had convergence, and we kind of let it go away. And that's Web TV. So we need to work on getting that back. What's Web TV? Really? You know what Web TV the, is? The Palm OS thing? But how no, 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 that's, that's Web OS. That's Web OS. Web TV is back in the day when they had like uh, you know like. Like net zero type of era where web TV was like you had your internet and your TV were the same thing and you just had, oh, you had yeah, a convergent they had the special experience. Keyboard? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember yeah. that. Brilliant. We should launch a company around no, that. No, we should Yeah, not. we should. I, Call I remember TV. that. That was miserable. <laughs> <laughs> Our security advisory this week is brought to you by Bitwarden and it's about using SSH keys to access your servers. So for server admins, this is you know a no-brainer. There's, they're already doing this kind of thing. But should be. Well, yeah, it should be. Uh, but for regular users who are setting up a server, there is a, a certain fear in using something other than passwords. But be for best practices, using an SSH key is the recommended method. Uh, DigitalOcean provides instructions of how to do this and how to properly set up SSH. And once you get to used to doing it, you will not want to ever go back. Uh, but besides, m many servers allow you to the ability to securely log into your console if you ever lose your SSH key. So you can have the option to go like that, but you can also by default turn it off so you can have a web console with DigitalOcean, for example, and be able to do it that way. But if you can also set it up where logging in with passwords is an, is an option if you get once you get used to the SSH key approach. And SSH keys can be uh, can be up to 4,996 bits in length, making them long, complex, and difficult to brute force, which is a very important value in having that security feature. And if your SSH service allows password-based authentication, then your internet-connected SSH server can be hammered all day and night by botnets or whatever trying to get to guess the passwords, and it won't do anything. So it's something you should definitely check out, check into of using SSH keys because they are very useful. And if you can, you can also like set it up to have a combination of the two to you know get used to it before you transition all the way. So that's just something and to keep in mind. Before we go on, Noah, didn't you create a guide for SSH, or am I mistaken? Was that the YubiKey nope. guide? That, that's exactly what it is. It is using YubiKey with the PKCS11 provider, which uh, there's there's a little bit of a split. Some people prefer to do uh, SSH with the YubiKey over the GPG module. I prefer the PKCS11 module. It it provides a little bit more flexibility and a little bit more uh, a, a couple more bells and whistles that that you can that you can switch. But the great thing is, you literally have, and I have it right here. I can show you. Um, I have these uh, this little thing that sits in a little USB extender that sits on my desk. And uh, there's one that goes into, there's one that you can wear around your neck. That's the one that most people are familiar with. But this one, they call it the Nano, and it just plugs into the USB port. And this is the only thing that sticks out. It just, everything past the little black thing. And so what happens is there's a little green LED on there. And uh, when I go to SSH into a computer, that little LED green, that little green LED starts flashing. I type in my, my pin, and then I tap it to let it know that I'm physically sitting in front of the computer and I'm logged in. And so I don't, I haven't, I haven't managed an SSH key or moved a file or, 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 or put a private key onto it. I haven't done any of that in years. And the great thing about the YubiKey is from the server side, you just get an SSH key like you would anywhere else. So you can put it up on Launchpad or whatever and just tell people, this is my public SSH key. But on the back end, if that device is plugged into your computer and you know your PIN, then you can get access to it. Way better way to do it. Nice. And where can people find instructions on that? Yeah, linuxdelta.com. We've got the wiki. Of course, I think we'll also be able to link it in the show notes. Yep, absolutely. And if you want another way to stay secure, you can get a password manager because password manager passwords are still very important. And they're also you also need to have a password manager that you trust. And we trust Bitwarden. Uh, so pa pass Bitwarden is a really awesome tool, but it allows you to have a randomly generated passwords for you can use on a variety of different uh, different websites. So you don't have to worry about like keeping up with whatever the password you have or having to worry about like if the password is strong enough because you just have them automatically generated for you. And another thing that I really love about Bitwarden is that it has a support for YubiKey. So if you have one of those, you can actually use YubiKey in conjunction with your Bitwarden. And another really cool thing is that they have a feature I never even thought of, and it's just 
it's very convenient. And is you don't you, like when you have a phone, you want to be able to have your phone and have the convenience of using a password manager, but also keep the security. So how do you do that without having a you know a device that has certain types of features? Like maybe you have NF, N, NFC on your phone, but maybe you don't. So a, a, a NFC YubiKey wouldn't work for some people. But they actually took into consideration and made a system where you have a pin code where you can say I want a four digit or a six digit or whatever amount of digits you want for a pin code, and you can remember that instead of your massively long password because of course your password manager should have a gigantically long password because it's very important to have the master password being the most complicated thing you can think of and also still remember but you don't want to type that massive password in every single time but you still want your phone to be secure so their pin code system allows you to have that and is one of those things that I didn't think I would want to exist but then when I found that it did I was super excited, super happy that it did because it also made it a lot easier to transition people to Bitwarden because they don't have to worry about, oh, I have to remember this password every single time. There's a solution where you don't have to and still have some great security. Another thing I love about Bitwarden is the fact that it's 100% open source software so you can get their code on GitHub and you can review, audit, or whatever. And they even have third-party audits as well. And because it's it's open source, you can even self-host it if you'd like to. Not only is it they trustable because you can actually see the code, but also, if you want to get the premium edition of Bitwarden, it's super cheap. It's only $10 per year, and you can get all of this value by going to bitwarden.com DLN. And we are so proud to have Bitwarden as a sponsor for the De- Destination Linux Network and the Destination Linux Podcast. So if you want to show that you're appreciative to them and you want to get a great password manager, then go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started today. And it's you can get started for free, but also if you appreciate it as much as I do, you'll definitely want to get that the premium account, especially since it's only $10 per year. Yeah. It's time to get everybody's blood pressure up a little bit as we tackle our big topic of the week. And that is, it's okay to use Nano. What? So, no, it's not. Vim okay. all the I, way. Listen, no, I agree. Emacs. I started using VI about? 15 years ago, and I haven't been able to get out since, and I've been very happy VI Who users. writes this crap? Well, you do. So oh. <laughs> you need to make a quick edit on the config. You don't have a lot of time. You don't have time to install Sublime Text, G-Edit, K, all of the other tools that would be easier to use. Um, so all of a sudden, you find yourself needing to do this in the CLI. Now, this is something I come across all the time when I'm on servers. Now, as a proper server admin that that has real skills, I just use VI because it's built into the operating system. But if that's not you, then I want to tell you about Nano. Nano, called GNU Nano, was created in 1999 to emulate and improve the Pico text editor because they knew there was no possibility that VI could be improved. It's much more user-friendly. The bottom of the screen provides you with a shortcut, so it tells you right what, what you want to do. And I think this is really one of the reasons that it has yes. it has become so popular is because when you get into it, it tells you if you have no idea what to do with this, this editor, it lets you figure it out much like you would if you were in a graphical user interface. And so it makes it very easy to make quick changes to files. Uh, let's just start quick, quick poll of the room. Ryan, what text editor do you use by default? Look, if I need to get something done really quickly or I'm writing a tutorial, it's Nano. Now, you guys know okay. I did the whole thing in Vim and I enjoy it and I actually figured out how to exit it, that meme where people smash their computers and say, couldn't figure out how to get out of Vim. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there are just times where you just want to get in, do something really quick. I'll either use Sublime Text to open up what I need and edit it there or Nano uh, from the terminal, but I'll use Vim as well. I think everybody should take the time to learn Vim. It's far more powerful at the end of the day. But one of the things that really frustrates me is seeing a tutorial for some basic step written for the Linux community and they suggest Vim. Because new users seeing that, or even people doing YouTube videos where they're using Vim and they're kind of going, well, let's take a look at the latest Ubuntu. And then they're going into Vim and they're doing all this stuff in there. Just makes people look at Linux and go, that's too complicated for me. I'm never going to use it, even though technically you never have to touch Vim. I I think there are ways that Vim should be improved because you know I love the fact that Nano has its shortcut keys listed there at the bottom. I don't see that as a defect or a negative. I know some Vim people would be like, no, I love that it's obscure and nobody can figure out how to exit. To me, that's just stupid software. <laughs> but you know, once you start using Vim and you realize the power that it has and the plugin capability and the speed of using it, yes, everyone loves it. But getting anybody to see that value, well, it you just have to be a special kind of person, a special kind of geek like most of us in our community. So I think there's some ways that Vim should be improved if we want to replace as people in our patron chat are saying and get rid of Nano forever and all this stuff. 
if you want to do that, then you've got to make BIM actually user friendly because it's not. Yeah, it's not. But I also like for me, the text editor thing is different because my text editor, like a normal text editor for me is, is sublime text. But when I talk when I'm talking about like doing basic configs, like quick config things or I'm doing like server based stuff. I'm just going to use Nano because it's faster and I'm not doing it enough where I need to have a full text editor in my terminal and that sort of thing. So my preference is for configs or doing through sysadmin stuff, which I don't do that much, would be Nano. But my main text editor would be uh, Sublime Text because it has the same value of the plugins and all that other stuff that people talk about for a vim and everything stall so it no, no you've been known to use nano so i i want you to confess no, here no, yes no, you no. have you I, absolutely I are really lying so. through your teeth right now you have used nano yeah i have i just don't ever prefer it here's here's why <laughs> the reality for me is i'm a function of the lowest common denominator is actually rekai that gave me this name he said that i'm the walmart linux user and the, the it, there's a lot of truth to it right um, the truth is, if I can if I can spend five minutes and learn how to use Vim, even if it is more complicated than Nano, and by more complicated I mean that they don't give you the shortcut keys, so you have to you have to memorize them. Um, but once you memorize what those shortcut keys are, and they're sane, right? You want to quit? It's cute. You want to write the? Oh yeah, uh, you're changing out your file stuff. That's used so often. In, well, uh, no, hold on a second. That's yeah. VI, not Vim. So oh, okay. Vim, right. you can use arrows. If you so if you get to that, if you open up, so let's start with this. If you start, if you open up with VI, you open up a text edit and you you go to use the arrow keys and you get B D D B D D B B B D D B and it just keeps creating lines. Go back out. So hit the escape key, full colon, quit, and then bang. So exclamation mark, which is don't save anything that I did, just exit out of the program. So intuitive. It's so yeah, simple. Very, you're like, well, yeah, this is this is like it's totally. Let me, let me like make my, and let me make my case. Let me, let me make my case, and then if you and then we'll see if you still disagree. So quit is Q. That makes sense to us. Uh, it's uh, if you just press Q, it's going to give you a message, and it's going to say, "Hey, I have changes. I don't want to just quit and not do your changes, but I also maybe I don't have pseudo privileges, or maybe because it had B D D B B D B B that came up. You don't want to save those changes. So what what do you want to do here? And Vim will tell VI will tell you. Go ahead when you hit escape and you want to quit, you're going to have to add an exclamation mark. And the way I look at it, that is I, I, I just say quit. And then I really mean it. I don't care what happens. I absolutely, I actually want you to quit the program and not save anything. I don't want you to write and quit. So I've exited back out sudo apt get install vim or you know yum install vim and once you install vim then whether you do vi or or vim it's going to sim link to running vim then you'll be able to use the arrow keys and you go through you make the changes press escape full colon right quit because I want to write the changes. I don't want to quit out of the program. Here's the the biggest thing to me about Vim and why I insist on using it over uh, a Nano is quite simple. Vim is on every single Linux computer I've ever used in my whole life. Doesn't so matter what version of Red Hat, doesn't matter what version of Ubuntu, doesn't matter what version of Debian. They all have VI on there. They don't all have Nano. And well, so, VI, not Vim, just to be clear. Yeah, that's I true. just tested in Pop! OS and Vim wasn't there, but VI That's is. right. Yeah. So once you kind of get down to, hey, I want to append this thing to a file. I want to add this thing. It's much quicker to just know that VI is going to be there and you're going to be able to use it. And if I'm going to install a second program, why wouldn't I just install Vim so I can use the arrow keys, which is really the only big difference I noticed in a, in a day to day working environment between VI and Vim. That's my rationale. Yeah, I, I don't think it's easy to use. And I think there's a lot of rationale where professionals and server admins and everybody should learn it and take the time to learn it. And I mm -hmm. think it's awesome to learn it. But I think for tutorials and new users and everybody else, using Nano is fine. And people shouldn't really be like, you know, beaten up over using Nano if they're not system administrators and those. Although, sure, take the time to learn it. It's very cool. And you're going to find a lot of power in it. It's really not necessary. Nano does most of what your regular desktop users are going to need. Yeah, I agree. To be with clear, that the rest of rest of users we don't make fun of, but I, Michael, if he uses Nano over Vim, I can still make fun of him, right? Well, he can't even use Nano. He has to use Sublime Text. He doesn't know how to use Nano. Right. Sublime Text. I just I said I use. Is the, is Sublime, Sublime is awesome. Text is the is the GUI. Uh, is the GUI implementation of Vim and Cody MD is, is the web-based implementation of Sublime Text. Oh, Stuff that's right. Uh, one of our patrons clarified um, he uses Notepad, the Microsoft Notepad to write his stuff. I'm sorry, what was that? Notepad. No, Notepad. no, that's nope. not true. So nope. I actually yeah, do. It's a Microsoft text editor. Never heard of it. Yeah. No, I, I use uh, Sublime Text++ 
Uh, it's actually much better. You know, as as terms of like sysadmins or DevOps or whatever, those, yeah, sure, they should use Vim. Why not? But in terms of like the average user, what is the point of saying, here's this tutorial that you want to learn this thing. You're going to have to load up a terminal and then like they're brand new to Linux. And then like, oh, now you need to learn Vim. And now you're going to like, it's so intuitive to colon WQ if you want to lo- leave the session yeah, right with all safe. If you no, want to write your changes and quit the changes, you type WQ. That's, that, that's not that's not intuitive. It's not remotely totally intuitive. intuitive. No. Totally not even close. close. Not even close. But it's fine for people who want to use just basic editing for nano. It's it's totally fine. But you know, I just like um, Sublime because is there something wrong with grepping a man page when you don't understand something? Is that where we no longer <laughs> allowed to make people use do the arch wiki fool? Yeah, there's here's even more stuff that makes it a little bit more complicated. It's so intuitive. <laughs> I just want to get my computer to work. Sorry, you're gonna have to learn Vim. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a small thing, small price to pay, but who am I to judge? <laughs> Sure. And you're like earlier in the show, in the, 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 the section, you were saying something like, and they don't need to update, you know, you need to improve, improve on VI, except for that's what Vim is. And you don't need to improve on Vim. That's what Neo Vim is. So like, I mean, no, there's no improvements. I was on the other side of the argument at that point. <laughs> oh, okay. That's fair enough. The point is Noah uses Nano, Michael uses Nano, and I use Nano from time to time, although I'm the master of Vim between the three of us. And so, you know, use whichever you want, but using Nano is fine. Right, yeah. Noah's, Noah uses Nano all the time. Let's move on. <laughs> this week in the gaming section, I want to cover the Humble Bundle because this is a pretty awesome bundle out there this week. You have the Age of Imperium is at hand in their newest bundle. So what does that mean? What do you get? Well, Warhammer. Warhammer is a ridiculously popular I don't know what you call it because it's a little bit of everything. It's like a card game, a board game, video games. It's just a very popular franchise out there. And you get a lot of games like Warhammer 40,000, Space Marine. You get a whole collection, Dawn of War 3. They have other games in there, Blood Bowl 2, Legendary. Plus, your purchase will support special effect and a charity of your choice. One of the things we all love about Humble Bundle is when you go buy these awesome packages. I got one that was a Python. Humble Bundle that came mm-hmm. with all kinds of books and instructions and and a free three months, I think, with Pie Charm and all kinds of things that were included in it for very low cost. And you get to give to charity at the same time. Some of the Linux supported games, not all of those will run natively on Linux, but Legacy of Dorn, of course, Warhammer 40,000, Dawn of War 2 and 3, I think run natively on Linux. The other ones do run on Proton, a lot of, a lot of them that I was checking but you want to support on the list because depending on how much you donate basically or pay for the package depends on how much of uh, how many of those games unlock at a time. So check those out. And the best part is you get to support charity while you're doing so. Up next in the show is the software spotlight. And we're going to be talking about MPV. MPV is a media player. It's free, open source, cross platform, works on all kinds of stuff. And in my opinion, is better than VLC, which is another cross-platform media player. And a lot of people are going to be like, what isn't VLC like the most go-to thing that people say? And yes, it actually is the most popular mentioned, but I think MPV is better because of yes. all sorts of reasons. Like the yeah, the powerful scripting capabilities you can use with MPV is really cool. There's so many different configurations of like extra features that are really rare in a media player, especially a video player. Like my favorite thing is there is a way to, you know, you have chapter bookmarks and all that stuff. But what's really cool is being able to save your state of what you're watching on you on MPV. You just hit uh, there's a you just hit Q to, sh- to kill the application. If you hit Shift Q, it will actually kill the application, but save where you were in the video that you have. So the next time you load that video up, it just starts exactly at that same spot as a a awesome save state feature. And it even works with if you load like a internet video. So if you have a direct file, like an MP4 or whatever, and you send it from your uh, internet, from your browser to MPV, and you just kill it on the shift Q approach, and you try to load it again later, it will remember it is there is there because it stores that save state is not intuitive as full colon wq pound right i 100 percent agree we need to we need to we need to petition mpv to change it to colon wq that way we know for sure that it's accurate so everybody can understand it really quickly i agree but it also has like these really cool playback speed features where you can like you can increase or decrease the playback speed you can do all sorts of stuff you can do screenshots really quickly It, it, it admittedly there most of these things are 
you know, as intuitive as Vim, which is not at all. So you need to know these shortcuts uh, to be able to maneuver, maneuver most of the cool features because the GUI is nice. It does have like a very minimal GUI in the sense of like being able to change the the sub the subtitles or turn on subtitles or uh, change the chapters. You can do those sorts of things through the GUI, and you can also play things you know pause and play through the GUI. But for the most of the power is you need to learn the shortcuts. We'll have a link to like the the, well, the documentation best one's for SM that. SM Player, but as I understand it, SM Player is based on MPV. Well, SM Player is a interesting media player where it has multiple backends and it uses M Player and MPV as the backend. So it's you can choose which one you want to use, but it, it is a really nice GUI in the terms of like having a, a third party GUI. But MPV has a, a GUI built into it. It's just a very skeleton, you know, minimal type of GUI. But for the most part, that's what I use anyway. But once you get used to having all the shortcuts and all the power it can offer you, it is a very powerful MP, uh, media player, and it's my favorite. So I, I don't use any X third-party GUIs. I just use MPV directly because I think it's by itself fantastic. So maybe I'll do some videos in the future that explain the different shortcuts and stuff. If people want that, you know, we can maybe right have after that. You do the Vim video? No, no, Vim's not intuitive enough. Therefore, I'm not going to be doing that video. Wow, <laughs> maybe no rude. will. After he, after him, pick up the slack. sure. After he makes his video about using nano and butter fast, you know, that's right. For yes. Sure. What? <laughs> Our tip and trick of the week is WM control. Now this is a CLI command that will help you interact with the X window manager. You can do things like make scripts to move windows to specific positions. Every time you can make windows appear on a particular window monitor. Michael, you use WM control, right? For doing your scenes here. And yeah. that's one of the reasons why we wanted to kind of bring this one up because it's a very powerful tool it's not intuitive but it's a very no, powerful yeah tool. it's not intuitive at all yeah it's wm control is a fantastic thing it's one of those like you know individual utilities that is very powerful and allows you to do a lot of cool features the thing that i like the most about it is it allows you to manipulate windows very quickly through a scriptability so like for example let's there, there's some issues with setting up different windows sometimes for different applications where you position it how you want to and then you close the application and the next time you open it it has changed its position randomly for no apparent reason and you know you have to do it again the next time and there are some applications that we use for making the show that have that problem where every single time i open it i have to reposition it so instead of just manually repositioning it i have a script that i run that will t tell that particular application to you use WM control and resize itself and reposition itself where I need it to be so that it can be the size I need, the position I need, and not have to worry about like getting it, you know, manually to exactly where I want. So WM control is a very useful tool for that. You can also tell it to, you know, open an application on a specific desktop or a specific monitor or whatever, that kind of thing. WM control is really cool. So if you, if you're in need for that kind of utility, check it out. We we'll have the links and details in the show notes for that. Let me ask you this, Michael. Why is it you use WM control over just using the the uh, the window management features of KDE? It seems like that's the way I've always gone about uh, accomplishing these same kinds of things and in a, in a more graphical and friendly way to do it. Well, the, the, one of the things that I like about WM control is that I can use it as a script and I can actually affect things that don't require... That's a good question. I use Plasma and KWIN window, window, window rules for most of the cases, but there is one thing that I really love about WM Control that it has a variable called active. So instead of running it on individual things or specifically setting up for a window that you're using, you can use WM Control to create a script, create the positions you want, and then you can manipulate it. Like, for example, if you want to have a window specifically positioned, but you want to have multiple different applications specifically positioned or specific size, you can use cold colon, active, colon, and that will be a variable to whatever you have, whatever window you currently have active. When you run that script, it will apply it to that whatever active window you have. So that's a really powerful variable to be able to use that uh, I don't know if any DE has that functionality to just do. Well, like, I3WM, but yeah. Well, I mean, to do active modifications? Sure. You can apply script. You could apply a script in I3WM to have it apply to any active windows. Okay, that's interesting. But I did say DE, not window manager, so therefore it doesn't count. But okay. moving on. Rude. So a big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening, however you do it, to Destination Linux. If you want more Destination Linux, become a patron 
like all of these amazing, beautiful people with us here today. And you get a bunch of perks like unedited versions of the show. And you get a link every week so that you can come watch us make the show live and you get the Patreon after chat and all kinds of fun things. So definitely consider supporting the show. Yeah, and you definitely want to check out the Destination Linux Network swag store where you can go get you show your love of open source and DL by getting some hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, and even more. No cap. If you're not a part of the DLN community, then you're missing out. And I high key encourage you to join the DLN discourse forum. Want to talk in real time? What? And get that tea? <laughs> well, join the DLN Telegram group. If you want to slay, join the DLN Discord server. If you want to find out what all of that means, please ask Michael. I don't even know what that means, Ryan. What does that mean? What's Man, no I cap? Looked up, I What's looked up no what are the cool terms kids are using these days. And yeah, this is what I came up with. No cap means you're not yelling, you know? No cap, no cap. If I say no yeah. cap, Noah, uh, you know, use I3, you know, I'm not yelling at you. But if I'm like cap Noah I3, that means I'm I'm yelling at you to use I3. But I don't have to raise my voice. I just have to start the sentence with cap or no cap. For you sure. Know, it's legit. Totally. Yeah, that's that's how you slay for sure. Yep. I, I, I'm down with the kids these days. I just go and Google all the cool terms they use <laughs> yep. and yeah, put them in the show. You notes are here. very cool. Very you're, hip. You're very down. So you're very down. Really and really also, uh, no cap. If you want to slay, you, you want to get some more content from us or anyone else in the DL network, then check out the website for Destination Linux Network. You can go to destinationlinux.network to check out all the great content. Definitely go to destinationlinux.network to get all the open source goodness that you can nom nom on. Also check out the Pseudo Show with Eric and Brandon. The Pseudo Show covers topics ranging from enterprise open source to cloud management. We also have a whole new cast on DLN Extend with Wendy and Matt, along with Nate and his almost unhealthy obsession with OpenSUSE. So make sure to check them out. Everyone have a great week and remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Have a Thanks good week, everyone. everyone. See you next week. Patience. Yay! Yay! Yeah. Patience, you can turn, on, turn on your camera. You join us. Oh my God, the visceral reaction in the Patreon chat when we said it's okay to run Nano was hilarious. Uh, <laughs> should be. Yeah. People understand. I like, agree. I agree. Yeah, VIs yeah. on everything. You should have some VI experience. But, you know. At least, here's the thing. Know how to open it. Know how to get to the line. Know how to add text and know how to save and get back out. If you can otherwise, do those, take a whole associate's degree worth of training in order to... Oh, it's not. Yeah, that I mean, bad. you know, it's not that bad. Five bad. It's pretty bad, but it's not that bad. It's pretty bad. <laughs>